Good afternoon to my friends here at the Wilson Center. Uh, good morning to my friends elsewhere in the world, or good evening, and a special welcome to our friends in Greenland. I'm Mike Sfrega. I'm the chair of the Polar Institute, and it is a privilege, it is an honor, to host today's Greenland Dialogue. Uh, I'm pleased because this is, for a number of reasons, near and dear to the Polar Institute's heart, but also a very important issue, and that is the future of Greenland. It's important to all of us who live and work and care about the Arctic, and it's the Prime Minister's first visit to the United States and first visit to Washington, D.C. So we're taking this opportunity to build yet another Greenland Dialogue. For those not familiar with the Greenland Dialogues, they started in 2017. They've come out of discussions with my friend Alice Rogoff, who joins us here today, President Grimson from Iceland, Ambassador Mark Brzezinski, my colleague Dave Bolton, and others, all to craft narratives and discussions and policy-driven uh, dialogues about Greenland, and in fact, in some places, for Greenland, so that we can help enable these really important discussions, and where the United States and Greenland together can work uh, for a shared future. I also want to thank my friend Jack Durkee, who, as many of you know, nothing happens at the Polar Institute without Jack, nor should it. So Jack has been around helping to create these Greenland Dialogues, but also all the other programs at the Polar Institute. So Jack, as always, thank you very much. All right, so as I said, we're taking advantage of this opportunity. It'll be a full day, but focused on issues related to the theme and title within today's event, and that is trade, minerals, and the green transition in Greenland. And it's a conversation with the Prime Minister. After the discussion with the Prime Minister, we'll have a panel discussion, uh, but preceding that, the Prime Minister and I will do a one-on-one -on -one discussion that will follow the themes and threads uh, of his speech. So the run of show will go as follows. I will in introduce our ambassador and CEO of the Wilson Center. Then there'll be a fireside chat between me and the Prime Minister following his remarks, and then a panel discussion. So it's indeed an honor to introduce Ambassador Mark Green, who is the CEO, the director, and the president of the Woodrow Wilson Center to start today's Greenland Dialogues. Mark? Uh, thank you, Mike, and welcome everyone to the Wilson Center. Uh, the Wilson Center is a unique institution in so many ways. We were actually established by Congress itself some five decades ago for the purpose, using their words, of strengthening the fruitful relation between the world of learning and the world of public affairs. And what that means in practical terms is that while many institutions deal in data and information and opinion and sometimes spin, we've been directed to go further, to pursue scholarship, to pursue learning. Our currency is knowledge, our focus is independent analysis, and our purpose is developing options and recommendations that policymakers can believe in. And importantly, we are fiercely nonpartisan. Like so much of the Arctic, in recent years, Greenland has been thrust onto the global stage. With extensive natural resources, like rare earth minerals and fisheries, a beautiful and globally important environment, a strategic location for security and other operations, and thriving community, Greenland is a unique player in both the Arctic and in global affairs. It is truly emblematic of the new Arctic. Today we'll have a marvelous opportunity to learn more about Greenland and that new Arctic as we welcome Greenland's Prime Minister, Mutbi Uilu, both to Washington, D.C. and to the U.S. This is his first visit to the U.S. And as Mike said, that makes the honor for us all the greater. We have a full day of activities planned for him, more than perhaps he thought when he was coming. We're going to squeeze everything we can out of his leadership and counsel, including later this evening, when we will present to him our Leadership Through Alliances Award. That award is meant to honor his vision of how Greenland's alliances across the globe can help develop Greenland's economic, political, and social future. But right now, we are excited to host the next iteration of the Greenland Dialogues, one of the Polar Institute's marquee initiatives. These dialogues are in partnership with the government of Greenland and its representation 
in Washington. As you heard, today's focus is on Greenland's economic development and trade. We will learn from the Prime Minister about the government's strategy and approach to trade, minerals, and the green transition in Greenland. We will also hear from several experts about these issues, all in the context of the U.S.-Greenland bilateral relationship. Prime Minister took office in 2021 and became the youngest leader in the history of Greenland. He previously served as Greenland's Minister for Foreign Affairs, Minister for Minerals, and has served in the Parliament of Greenland since 2015. During his time in Parliament, the Prime Minister has served on the Committees of Business and Trade, Foreign Affairs and Security, and Business Environment and Minerals, among others. And so it is now my great honor to welcome to the stage Prime Minister Mutbi Uilu. Welcome. Ambassador Mike Koena, Thank you, Ambassador and Mike. I have been looking forward to my first visit to the U.S. since I taking office in spring 2021, and I'm happy to be here today. First, I want to thank the Wilson Center for hosting me. The Polar Institute consistently puts the Arctic on the agenda in Washington, D.C., enabling important dialogue and cooperation on wide range of issues of importance to not just the Arctic, which we in Greenland call home, but to our entire planet, which we all call home. I want to thank you for the important work you do and for the cooperation we have with you under the Greenlandic Dialogues umbrella. The government of Greenland prioritizes efforts to contribute to the international agenda, and it is, and it is which vital for us to engage in the constructive international cooperation with our neighbors, close partners, and allies. Climate change remains a priority for all, not least for, for us in Greenland. Climate change is the real threat to our traditional way of life a treat to our communities and livelihood. The world's eyes are looking at the Arctic as we are decision makers try to sort out what the changing of the cli climate will mean for our populations. In this regard, I and my government are ready to take our share of responsibility for actions. Climate change the melting ice caps and rising temperature are creating new attention to our region. The threat to the planet and uh, to our way of living is evident and needs action from us all. Greenland has decided to contribute to the effort of mitigate the consequences of the climate change regardless of the polluter. Greenland is already contributing to the global reduction of carbon pollution. At the moment, more than 70% of our electricity is produced from green energy through our five hydropower stations. Last year, our parliament in Atisabdut decided to construct within the next five years one more hydropower station and expand another. This initiative will bring our coverage up to more than 19% percent green energy from electricity production. We further see possibilities for international partners utilizing our vast, vast hydropower resources and unique climate. Possibility for server farms and power to X processes, processes producing climate friendly ammonium or hydrogen green fuel are some of our priorities. We are right now in the process for, of opening up to investors who can invest in our waste hydropower resources for the production of green energy solutions. This is great ambition. Addressing climate change and we see foreign interest, interest in our re renewable energy sources. So, Greenland could become a net exporter of renewable energy within the coming decades. 
American investors are here more than welcome to bid on the hydropower concessions in Greenland. In that respect, we have focusing, uh, focusing on uh, wider economic and commercial rela relationships, also cooperation into education, capacity building, science and development. Future cooperation could involve investment of the green transition, both in terms of uh, critical minerals and hydropower for green fuel production. These ambitions also call for investments in, in infrastructure and telecommunication networks. Government of Greenland is already investing both in new airports and ports to support the possibilities for development. We prioritize sustainable economic development as a strategic goal for creating a self-sufficient and climate-resilient economy. Therefore, as an open economy, we are seeking new partnerships, commercial partners in business ventures, who abide by our laws and engage to the benefit of the people of Greenland. And we are welcoming like-minded partners in this process. It is the ambition of the government of Greenland to obtain a formal agreement with the United States in serving ongoing dialogue with the U.S. on trade and investment to support our goals. Climate is unfortunate, unfortunately not the only change we are ex experiencing. As Putin's unacceptable aggression with the Russian invasion of Ukraine has only reminded us it is vital to strengthen cooperation, trade and political ties between allies and friends. The government of Greenland condemns the Russian war on, on, on and in Ukraine, and there should, be to, there should be no doubt where Greenland has placed itself in the question of this war. This only makes it, it the more important the, that we, among allies, have constructive and fruitful talks on increased cooperation between our countries, also on trade. Establishing trade between Greenland and North America is one of our central priorities. The eastbound bound trade has long been a main market for Greenlandic trade, but we hope a new market in the West will open for Greenland in the co years to come. The Arctic is increasingly becoming a high-end tourist destination. In Greenland, there's steady increase in the number of tourists. The new airports are being built but both foreign partners and investments are needed. For instance, in the hotel sector and the airlines to bring the expected increased influx of tourists. Our aim is to create sustainable tourism open to the world and in respect for our fragile environment. It is broadly shared vision in Greenland that tourism will constitute a significant part of our diversified future economy. And this is, will be for the benefit of not only the local population, but also for our international partners. This is this in an um, opportunity for both American airlines, tourism operators and investors within the hotel sector to create part partnerships for unique destinations. We are open for investments. And Greenland remains a pro-mining nation and welcome mining. While my government has banned uranium mining, we welcome all other projects which are in the line with the environmental standards set out by the government of Greenland and in our Mineral Resource Act. Mining provides great potential for both investors and for the Greenlandic society, and we seek to develop the sector further in the coming years. We already have several major projects in the pipeline and are, are welcoming further activities, especially with like-minded nations. Partnerships and close friendship are, as I have started earlier, stated earlier, even more necessary today and in the coming years. And in the light of the global change Change, uh, global changes in climate and security, I want to be clear. United States is Greenland's most important strategic partner 
and I, I believe the United States will remain our strong, strongest strategic partner, whatever chances in the future might bring. All in all, I believe we should work hard to be mutually prefer preferred partners in the Arctic when we talk about investment and commercial cooperation in green transition, sustainable tourism, and responsible mineral exploration. I look forward to the conversations here today and for our future partnership in the new Arctic. Thank you. It's a little bit hot here <laughs> in Greenland. That we, we didn't have this summer you have here. <laughs> he said it first, not me. Uh, <laughs> Prime Minister, thank uh, you. We'll give you a moment to get uh, have some water, uh, please. And this traditional anoa is made for a long time ago to bring the warm inside in the, in the body, so. Is it working? So it's working. OK, yes. good. Thank you very much for, for your comments, uh, m possibly more important, your presence here today and, and with the rest of your, your government representation. Uh, it, I think these are important discussions to have, obviously, uh, but to have you lay out a vision for your government and where you are going uh, and how you will go about crafting uh, Greenland for the future is important for us to hear. And it makes us think about what role we would all have collectively, not just the United States or the Wilson Center, what role we have collectively in the North mm -hmm. as Northerners, but globally. Mm -hmm. And now, as, as Ambassador Green said, Greenland is now a, is global mm -hmm. uh, for, for a lot of reasons. Mm -hmm. Some concerns, many concerns yeah. about the melting of the Greenland, Greenlandic ice cap and what that means for all of us, mm -hmm. but yet it provides perhaps some opportunity as well, mm -hmm. maybe not as much as we would like. Mm -hmm. But as you noted, everything from tourism to economic mm -hmm. development, on and on, there, there is a vision for, for, for Greenland in the future. Mm -hmm. And that's perhaps emblematic, as Mark said, is of the new north. Mm -hmm. So we want to thank you for laying out that vision. I would like to follow up for the next 15 or 20 minutes, or however long you can stand being in the, in the anorak there. Uh, some of the themes that you, you teased out, it's clear, taking some notes and thinking about this a bit, that your vision is, of course, for Greenland, but you have a North American perspective in mm -hmm. one way. And the North American perspective being Alaska, mm -hmm. Canada, mm -hmm. Greenland, in one way, right? There's, a, there's this, as you laid out, we've said it many different ways, a, an arc of, of cooperation mm -hmm. between us all. But you've made me think that maybe it's, a, it's an arc of commonality. Mm -hmm. We share a lot mm -hmm. in the North, Greenland, Alaska, Canada, and our friends in Norway, Sweden, Finland, I can keep going, huh? which you've laid, out, laid it all out, and how very central the United States plays prominent in your, in your vision. Mm -hmm. So you're here in D.C. Uh, what, what is your hope aside from, and I, I did take note that you're looking for an agreement with the United States, mm -hmm. but what is that you hope to, I in a sentence or two, what are you trying to, to do here in Washington, D.C., that when you leave, mm -hmm those will remember a few sentences from you that will make the United States think or act, and corporations in the United States think and act perhaps a bit differently than before you came here. I think that uh, we, ha we are close partners in, and have been close partners in many years. But I think uh, before uh, the war starts in uh, Ukraine, we have I've forgotten a little bit in, uh, in, in our part of the world and allies that uh, partnership, partnerships together with the near allies and partners are very, very important. Mm. And uh, in, the, in the new uh, development in, and, uh, and the ice is melting in, in, in the Arctic area and the new roads, uh, trade roads is opening in, in this area, we need to rethink our partnerships and uh, develop our partnerships for the future. So I, I hope that uh, we can uh, move a little bit closer to a new era of our partnership uh, together with Greenland and, uh, and US and among uh, uh, all, the, all the countries in, in North America uh, because we are in the middle of everything. If, uh, if you look uh, at the Arctic, uh, just on the Greenland is covered around 20% of, uh, of the Arctic. 
minimum 20% of the Arctic because we have a, a, a new uh, agreement with Canada yesterday in the new boundary, so I need to calculate that. We're going to come a little back to better. that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I hope that uh, our visit here can, uh, can be a stepping stone for a new era because uh, the new Arctic is uh, on, on, on behind the door. So, so th that's my biggest hope because we have a lot to share. We are living in, uh, uh, as you said, in Alaska, Canada, and Greenland in, in the Arctic area and uh, an environment, environment who uh, is very, uh, what you call it, uh, we need to protect it. Mm -hmm. But uh, also think about uh, to, to have some uh, growth and uh, economic development. I think sometimes, uh, thank you for that. And by the way, I, I just got, uh, they don't mean to be rude, but I just got a text that's saying, yes, they're working on the air conditioning. Uh. So that, that's, really, that's a central topic up here right now. Yeah. Uh, so we'll and you're also from I, Alaska. I'm yeah. so yeah. glad I have this wool suit on, yes. Uh, but uh, there is this balance in the North we're all facing, mm. and that is how do we provide for not just the 4 million pe people that live above the Arctic Circle, central to that, mm. the indigenous peoples of mm. the North. Another thing we share, uh. language, uh. culture, uh all of those things. And landscape is culture. Mm. It is Food is our culture. Uh. Language is our culture. Uh, but, but we're in this paradox that we have to navigate through, mm. which is how do we develop the North, which has mm. traditionally been built on a resource extraction development, and fully take into account mm. that our climate is not just warming, mm. it is heating. Mm. Today, reports, research indicates maybe some places in the Barents mm. seven times mm. Yeah. Right, we know three to four times else in, in, in the Arctic regionally. So what are your thoughts about how we balance the, the need for development for us to live in the North with the realities of, a, of current day climate change and the impacts of the glo on the globe? As Inuit, at, at, at we are in, in Greenland, uh, the indi indigenous people, we have always lived with, with, uh, with our nature and, uh, and, uh, and use our nature. And uh, if you uh, our partners in the western part of uh, of the world can listen to the indigenous people, what they need, what they want. I think we can find a solution for for this development mm -hmm. and growth. So I think uh, our I have used uh, uh, some words uh, the last one year that uh, nothing without us, uh, nothing about us without us. So if you think at this way and respect uh, the people who's living in the, in the Arctic, I think we can find some solutions for, for the economic growth and cultural growth and development on, in all the way. I, I want to tie two mm. things together yeah. and then ask you a question. Yeah. Because based on your, I, I took note of, uh, it is, th these are my words, it's, but I think, I think they're pretty much close to a quote, uh, ambition of, of your government to obtain a formal agreement with the United States. Mm. Uh, to ensure that there's investments, uh, that um, basically you're, you're a friend in need of economic development uh, that's mutually beneficial, thinking here on the bilateral side, but also multilateral, uh, and, and also that there is this balance between um, resilient economy, economic development, which we'll dig into a little bit more, and sort of self-sufficiency, mm -hmm. having Greenland be self-sufficient economic development. But I'm hearing... I'm hearing a thread, a theme of, but there must be social justice. And uh -huh. how do you balance the, that in Greenland with, with mining and the development of ports and roads and aspirations mm -hmm. with having the voice of the Greenlanders involved in that? Uh, for example, I, I, uh, in my speech, I, I said that we want a sustainable uh, development in tourism. It means that uh, we don't want mass tourism. We want people who can come there and uh, respect our nature and, and environment. And it's the same for the, the mining industry and uh, the same for, for all the other investment in Greenland. It, so, because uh, we have uh, seen uh, some uh, uh, other countries uh, like us have an uh, economic development, but maybe have forgotten the people who are living in, uh, in these nations. And uh, in Greenland, we want uh, uh, a development and economic growth, but uh, we always have living with our environment and uh, and with our nature, and uh, and uh, and we are the modern uh, community. But uh, we still have this uh, in our mind that uh, before we do something, we think about our environment, 
and uh, the influences it it can come if we, if we do some uh, some steps. Okay, thank you. Well, then let's talk about mining and mm. green transition mm. because you know if you when you follow the articles in in U.S. newspapers mm. and abroad, mm. uh, it sounds like there's a rush. Everyone coming in and investing a lot of money yeah. in mines in Greenland. Yeah and lots of critical minerals, yeah. rare earth yeah. minerals, and of course, mm -hmm. uh, as you said, Greenland's yeah. open for, for business. So can you talk to me a little bit about how you're balancing the development, what your visions are for these mines, mm -hmm. who, wh where are they, what would they look like, mm -hmm. and how you would balance those, mm -hmm. and how they play into, with the environment, yeah. and, and how they would play into a global mm -hmm. green transition. Mm -hmm. This is not just about Greenland's transition, yeah. correct? Yeah. Sorry? No, no. Correct? Yeah. I mean, that's, it's, yeah. it's more than yeah. Greenland, yeah. but more than Greenland's yeah. Yeah. place yeah. in the global stage. Yeah in this particular area? Yeah. So we always have, uh, the last decades, we have uh, the mining uh, industry who's in increasing right now. We have uh, two active mines, is that right, Thomas? Yes. And uh, we have some uh, some bigger ones in, on, on the pipeline, uh, as I said. But uh, we always think about uh, when we, w no, let me see in, in another way. We always li listening to to the people and uh, the way they are they are thinking about uh, if we want to open a mine. Uh, for example, uh, in my speech, I said that we planned uranium mining. Uh, there was an, an an project in South Greenland who, where the local community was against. Uh, the most of the uh, uh, local community was against uh, uh, this mine project. So that's one of uh, the reasons that we have uh, taken the steps to ban uh, uranium mining because we also think about our children and grandchildren and their children and the grandchildren after that we don't want uh, a waste of uh, uranium in, uh, in their backyard. Mm. Yeah. But yet you do see a willingness yeah. of the Greenlandic people to create mines mm. that can be sustainable, yep. environmentally yep. as stringent as as friendly and mm. as productive as you possibly can, not only to make that happen for the global markets, but that is a pillar of what you see for, I'm asking, yep. a pillar of what yep. you see for the Greenlandic people and the Greenlandic government going forward. Yes. It's a key yes, part. Yeah. And, and the uranium issue, it, it got convoluted. It was mm. confused, mm. I think, in, in many, many places mm. that because of the because no mining on, on the uranium issue, some headlines read no mining in Greenland. Mm. And what you're saying is that's not the case. No. That that's not the case. We are open for 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 investment in in, in mining, but not for uranium. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, right now we have, uh, as uh, as I said, we have two mines: one a ruby mine and uh, and one mine with uh, with some anodoside uh, mineral. But uh, and. Uh, in uh, in the pipeline, we have an uh, an zinc mine in up north in the uh, in the top of the Greenland top of Greenland and uh, and another uh, projects like a, a coal mine in, in 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 South Greenland and and back in the history we have uh, uh, some some mines who have been uh, very influential for for development like the Evitud uh, mine in uh, in South Greenland who uh, with Cryolid who who made uh, some of uh, of the aircraft and uh, and more than more than then in the, in the Second World War, mm -hmm. so we have a, a trade bet between U United States and and Greenland at, th at this time and uh, and uh, and at this time the Greenlandic people also feel the development and to be part of the world. Mm -hmm. So we still think the same way, but uh, also thinking about our environment. And in order to get to these mines, you know, the North is rich in a lot of these resources, but we are infrastructure yeah. poor. Mm -hmm. So it's not just opening up a mine. Oh. You have to have roads to that mine. Oh. You have processing oh. plants. You have to have electricity. Oh. You oh. have to have so much oh. more that oh. goes into that. How do you approach that component of it, which is not just the mine, oh. but the infrastructure and the energy? How do you get energy to these mines to oh. fuel them? Uh, some uh, some of the projects think about uh, to, to use uh, hydropower, but, uh, but we're also lucky because in, in other other countries, uh, the the mines is in middle of nowhere, mm -hmm. but uh, also uh, very far away from from the harbors. Uh, in Greenland, you can open a mine in the middle of nowhere, but really nearby uh, the sea. So so you have uh, so you can invest a, a, a little bit better, but uh, you. 
but I think also that uh, uh, we are thinking to uh, develop our economy with the with mining, but uh, we are also thinking about uh, develop our uh, our economy with uh, the green green transition, uh, and we have a lot of water in Greenland, and a lot of potential to 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 make some. Uh, uh, as I said, uh, power to X solutions uh, like like that, like that, but and also in solutions for server farms, uh, and uh, I think that uh, this is the way uh, the world is thinking right now. The young people thinking about green transition and the climate changes, and uh, maybe the older generations think a lot of about oil exploration mm -hmm. and mining exploration, but uh, we need to think about uh, the coming generations and the wishes the the, uh, the think about and uh, the wish that uh, we invest in, in in green solutions so i think we need to rethink some of uh, some our uh, some our uh, ideas we we always have been uh, have in, in the last decades but uh, we need to think about uh, the new future in the new arctic in the new world and uh, the young people want green transition and thinking about the climate changes. And so it's it's more than just laying out a strategy for Greenland. It's yeah. rethinking. Yeah. It's 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 reflecting yeah. a, an entirely global transition in thinking, not just a transition in, in energy. Yeah. If I'm if I'm right, yeah. right. Uh, so it, let, I want to talk a little bit more about the hydropower yeah. because that has potential. Not just to it does fuel mm -hmm. your your <laughs> sorry. It fuels yeah. your your needs yeah. almost ninety percent coming up. Yeah. But also that could be maybe an export of energy. Oh. Correct. It's correct. Yeah. And uh, right now we have uh, we have started in, uh, to we have two two places in the, in, in the middle of Greenland, and uh, we try to find some investors right now to to invest in, in these projects. Uh, there's a lot of uh, a lot of power there. How much hobby we have. Uh, Enormous. Yeah. Enormous. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good number. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so so we are thinking uh, at this way. Uh, we in Greenland we have uh, beginning to invest in hydropower since uh, in the end of uh, 1980s, and uh, from that we have developed because uh, uh, the, the last. Uh, 20 to 30 years, uh, and uh, now we have 70 percent of our electricity is from uh, from this hydropowers. And uh, as I said, that and you say that uh, 90 percent, uh, more than 90 percent, will be covered in the next uh, five mm -hmm. to six years. And is that one of the reasons, or the principal reason, that the government has decided not to further explore oil and gas? Yes, it's it's a way of thinking, oh. but also you have you have you have this replenishable resource that fuels your 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 communities it's one of the main re uh, reasons that that we do that but we also see uh, the big countries on in in the world and uh, and, and and other countries is changing uh, the oil and uh, uh, coal and uh, and gas uh, with the uh, green solutions and uh, and we also can see the uh, the big oil companies is not interesting in in the Arctic uh, last uh, ten to fifteen years. Uh, so why not think about the next the next one mm -hmm. than uh, the uh, uh, the things uh, we can call so last year? It sounds to me like uh, you're 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 making an argument mm. to and a good one by the way, which in my opinion, but you're making an argument. As if someone who is in a good way mm. is selling an equation, mm. an economic equation, mm. that's a win-win. Mm. What I mean by that is mm. that you're making an argument to invest in Greenland, mm. not just for Greenland, although, of course, but also there's some larger societal benefits. Mm. There's, a, there's a benefit on the other side of that investment equation, but there's also a global benefit. Mm. But, but you could also make money. I mean, that, that's the big question for uh, industry. Industry uh, will follow money. Uh, and policy and yeah. stability and rules and, mm. and the rule of law yeah. and predictability yeah. and political political predictability yeah. is that what is that the un another underlying message that you're giving out is that if you invest in us yeah. it's like investing in you whoever that might be yeah. Yeah. that's it 
Okay, well yeah. then we're done. <laughs> you know, but but it seems to me that that that's that's a, a narrative that plays out embedded in your speech, but also what I'm hearing in mm -hmm. terms of your the way you're answering these questions yeah. is that it's a good place to invest, yeah. uh, and in fact you are open for business. Mm -hmm. Speaking of that, lots of countries have mm -hmm. have looked have looked to Greenland, mm -hmm. uh, you know the United States as well as many others, mm -hmm. uh, but there's been discussions about like-minded countries mm -hmm. and maybe countries that we may have big differences with oh. here. And so, you know, I, I can't, can't not ask you the big question, which is how much investment comes into Greenland and from where? Not, not dollar amounts, oh. but in terms of level of degrees, where does it come from? That is a big question that people have about Greenland. Uh, the, the investment is more from, uh, from Europe, uh, but uh, when we so look for our export, it's going to East. Uh, around 40% of our export is going to China. Mm and uh, around 15 percent our uh, from our export from the last uh, years it was going to russia so that's why we with our sanctions against uh, russia that like you do mm -hmm. uh, have beginning to think really think about our our export markets and uh, and uh, people who can and countries can who can uh, invest in 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 greenland so now we are thinking a lot of that the first ones must be our uh, closest friends and like-minded nations. Uh, and then uh, if other countries want to uh, invest in Greenland, in our legislations and in our way, uh, we are open for business. But uh, first of all, if our friends can invest in Greenland, thank you. It would be the, uh, the first ones we, we, we will say uh, uh, that we will welcome. Mm -hmm. Because w we're saying China without mm. saying China, mm. and that's, I'm not good or bad. Yeah. The fact is yeah. that that is an issue, yeah. uh, whether it's China or other yeah. nations. But what you're saying is we're, we're looking for our current partners mm. to invest even more in us, and we'd mm. prefer to go in yeah. that direction, yeah. but yeah. but okay to a diversified portfolio of investment yeah. in Greenland. Yeah, and, uh, and we feel a little bit that our closest friends have not been uh, invested as we, as we wish mm -hmm. uh, the last year. So... Now we are uh, changing our strategy to come to our friends, make some new partnerships, and uh, take the next step to, to the new Arctic. And uh, if you want to be uh, a part of uh, development in the Arctic, you can go uh, without Greenland, because we are in the middle of the Arctic. We cover more than 20% of the Arctic. And if you want uh, the economic growth and want some uh, growth from your investment and make some money, in the Arctic, you need to cover it in Greenland, okay. and uh, we are open for, for these businesses. I want to be respectful of your time, but yeah. just maybe two more yeah. questions. Uh, the North requires research, mm -hmm. technology, mm -hmm. and innovation, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Yeah. Maybe not in that order, and that, that's a long list, but just three. Uh, and in terms of, of Greenland, where does research and technology and innovation play in your overall strategy? It's a, it's a, a, a key role, but uh, we're also on the 57,000 inhabitants. And as scouts, we try to find partners and uh, countries and people and uh, scientists and investors who can uh, cooperate with. So, so we can have these uh, issues and, and uh, you, you, you talk about. Okay. Uh, I want to go back. I lied. There's another two questions. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe three? No, uh, no, no. We'll see how this goes. <laughs> it may just be one and we're done because uh, you may not. Uh, but in terms of the sanctions in Russia, I mean, that's, that is a – it caught our attention, uh, caught my attention, uh, caught the U.S. It caught the global attention uh, that – that Greenland would participate mm. in a what is what constitutes a mostly global yeah. sanction package mm. against Russia. Yeah. So I have to ask you why, is certainly with with the economic mm. uh, impact it would have mm. to to the government of Greenland. That's a significant mm. portion. Mm. And what other markets, maybe the U.S., but what other markets are you looking at? Because it, it's a really interesting decision you made. So help us think through yeah. why you did that, yeah. and then how you might take up the slack. Uh, in, in moving that product elsewhere? Uh, we are a part of the international uh, community and, uh, and we, uh, we are uh, 
uh, uh, one uh, uh, we are one uh, of of your allies in in the western part of uh, of the world so that's how we are in uh, in these sanctions and uh, in many years we have fighting uh, to get independence in Greenland and uh, we respect the international laws and when a country uh, like Russia with uh, uh, with Putin uh, have aggression against uh, an other country and not respect the boundaries and uh, breaking uh, the international laws of course we need to be uh, part of uh, the rest of the world to uh, to fight against uh, uh, this aggression and uh, of course, that uh, our export to Russia, as uh, I told before, that it's around 15% the last years. And uh, now we are trying to open market in the US, in Canada, and uh, and actually we also have a good export to, to, to UK and Europe. Uh, and right now we are have uh, in, uh, in, uh, negotiations with the UK, with the FTA, Free Trade Agreement. And then we try to have a trade agreement with the outer uh, like-minded uh, countries. So, and we also can see the our fishing exports the last year have uh, increasing here in US. So we hope uh, we can uh, open the market here in, uh, with also be because we have a uh, high product, a uh, high level of uh, 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 of our our fish. Thank you. One last question. Yeah. So we 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 held to the two three questions. Yeah. You mentioned Canada, yep. so let's talk about Hans Island. Let's yep. let, let me let you share with those <coughs> who don't know yep. why it was so significant. Uh, the ceremony yesterday, yep. the agreement yesterday. Yep. Uh, first of all, I will uh, call uh, Hans Island, uh, as you know it in in the Greenlandic and the Inuit way, Tuktu mm-hmm. uh, They have always been an an area uh, where the Inuit in Canada and and Greenland have living and uh, have some uh, hunting and and more than that and have uh, made some families and friends together on the on the port side uh, that's why it's important that we have uh, this solution uh, and agreement uh, last day with with canada and and greenland and denmark uh, it's also important that uh, we sh- uh, show uh, uh, other countries like russia that uh, the diplomacy respecting the international laws and uh, uh, have a strong partnership and have low tension is very important to develop the Arctic and the rest of the world. So claims over one island with a history that predated today's political boundaries uh, was settled by both outside of courts and outside of just just done together two two entities for the benefit of both both entities, both countries, both governments. Yes. Yeah. But but and uh, first. and also with this uh, boundary agreement with uh, Hans Island in in Tuktubalu, we also have agreement in the maritime uh, on the west coast of Greenland and east coast of of Canada with four thousand almost four thousand kilometers uh, maritime boundary, who's uh, the longest maritime boundary in <laughs> right now. So, with diplomacy, with uh, respect for international uh, uh, laws and. Uh, and of course, with dialogue, you can always make some solutions without war. I cannot top that as the final, final note. So, Prime Minister, thank you for spending time with us, for doing it here at the Wilson yep. Center, for being in D.C., and we, we wish you very well. Yep. But thank you for the honor of letting us host yep. you, and I hope that we do this again here and perhaps even in Nuke as well. Yep. Right. You are all welcome in Nuke. So. We have uh, the Arctic Circle uh, uh, session in Nuuk in, in August, so I know you will join us I'm there. going to do yep. my very yep. best to add to your yep. economy by coming <laughs> in August, and, and you did get a good yep. tourism plug in there at the yep. very end. Please, everyone, thank the Prime Minister for his time here today. In a, t- we'll take about a moment. We're going to transition now from the Prime Minister's yep. time here into a panel, so just yep. give us one moment. Good. Thank you.
I can ask the panelists to come up, please. All right, let's try this again. On now? All right, thank you very much. Uh, thanks to my friends in the in broadcast booth who not only got us through a pandemic, but continue to make great programs happen uh, almost all the time here at the center. Thank you, um, all of you, for making that possible. I'm joined now by friends and colleagues to follow up on the discussion we just had with the Prime Minister. <coughs> and we thought we would do a little bit deeper dive into his themes, his uh, points of view, uh, the government's direction, uh, but from a little bit different perspective. Uh, so uh, allow me to introduce them, and uh, we'll, we'll skip around a little bit in our, in our discussion points, but we'll make this uh, maybe a two, three minute comments each. I'll follow up with a question, and then maybe for the remaining time we can, we can just engage in a discussion among ourselves, okay? So to my left, uh, many of you know, uh, Kenneth Hope, who is the head Greenland representation here in, in Washington, D.C. Kenneth, longtime friend, great colleague who does uh, an incredible job representing Greenland here in Washington, D.C., also in Canada. So uh, quite a busy man who doesn't sleep a whole lot, I don't think. Uh, my friend Dana Eidsness, who's the director of the Maine North Atlantic Development Office, uh, as, as Alaskans say, the other Arctic state. <laughs> Dana, thank you for flying down to, to be with us today. Really important that you're here and a great message uh, to bring to us. Our, our colleague, Paul Hooper, the Director of Energy and Mineral Programs of the Bureau of Energy Resources at the U.S. Department of State. Paul, thank you. We know that you are right in the middle of all the discussions that we just talked about in terms of rare earth, critical minerals, mining, and all those things. So we'll look forward to, to your comments. Uh, David Brown, David, thank you so much for, for joining us. Dave's the Director of Technical Support Office, Bureau for Europe and Eurasia, U.S. Agency for International Development, and we know how central USAID is to many of the things we just talked about here today, so David, thank you very much. Uh, and Thomas Loritz, and Thomas, thank you very much for, for coming from, from Greenland. We very much appreciate you doing that. Uh, Thomas is the Chief Advisor, Ministry of Mineral Resources and Justice, the Government of Greenland. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, you've heard the Prime Minister's uh, speech, his new vision, and, and uh, not just for Greenland, but it seemed Greenland in a global context, at least it did to me, Greenland in a global context, uh, and his uh, focus on sort of what the youth want and where, where, that, where that government goes and how that government builds its future and how important it is to have like-minded nations invest, partner with, think about Greenland, uh, and think about Greenland in terms of other countries' roles and relationships with Greenland and Greenland's, country, Greenland's relationships with other under the countries as well. So um, I found it uh, not, not just fascinating, but to think about Greenland in a global context and how it fits into this globalized Arctic that we now all live in. Uh, so even though we're seated this, this way, and Kenneth, pardon me, but Paul, I, I would like to start with you. May I give you a few minutes just for your opening comments, and then I'm gonna come back and ask you a few questions as well. Great. Thank, you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. I would like to thank the Wilson Center's Polar Institute um, and the Green Atlantic Rep Representative's Office in Washington and the Ministry of Mineral Resources and Nuke uh, for the kind invitation to participate as a panel, as a panelist in today's important discussion in the context of what is a very special place in the Arctic. It is a sincere p pleasure to be here with you, especially with His Excellency the Prime Minister, um, Kenneth Hu, and Thomas Loritzen, um, who, who I've known for quite some time. Uh, to share some thoughts about sustainable mining development in Greenland. 
The mineral resource potential in Greenland is quite significant. It includes not just rare earth elements, um, a topic often focused on by the popular media, but also iron ore and ferro alloys, base metals, specialty metals, precious metals, gemstones, industrial minerals, and dimension stone. Specific mineral commodities, a topic um, in these groups, including light and heavy rare earths, cobalt, nickel, copper, niobium and tantalum, titanium and vanadium, the platinum group metals, tungsten, graphite, and many others are critical to supporting the advanced technology and clean energy applications the world will need in increasing quantities. A number of Greenland's assessed mineral deposits are world class, um, ranking top globally in either size, grade, or both. This resource potential relates to Greenland's unique geological history and is associated with deposits dating from the first pieces of solidified crust after early earth cooled to magmatic intrusions resulting from tectonic activity in the North Atlantic only tens of millions of years ago. It is a complex and varied history that extends throughout Greenland's ice-free coastline, an area of which is about the size of California. Perhaps a few hundred mining companies have prospected, explored, and operated mines in Greenland, but only a fraction of its resources have, have been identified, characterized, and assessed. And there is no doubt that it has the potential to become an important contributor to supporting the world's green transition and the security of global supply chains. It is essential to frame any discussion on this topic with the understanding that Greenland has a long history of mining going back to the mid-1800s. Mining is not a new activity there. Zinc lead, gold, olivine, coal, copper, gemstones, feldspar, marble, and graphite. Um, all of these mines have existed and produced millions of tons of ore. The prime minister mentioned a Vigtut. A Vigtut was the largest and most famous open pit mine in Greenland. It was operational from 1854 to 1987 and was the world's only source of cryolite, which in its molten form supplied the solvent needed for aluminum refining that directly supported U.S. aircraft manufacturing during World War II. At present, the White Mountain and North Site and the Aplatak um, Karunda mine have exported to consumers in North America, Europe, and Asia. Many former mines still hold economic ore potential. The Nalanak Gold and the Amatsak Graphic Mines are two good examples, and companies are looking at ways to restart them. Throughout the changes in leadership over the years, the Greenlandic government has consistently prioritized its support for seeking investment to expand mining for national benefit. Although mining is not new to Greenland, a valid question is, what does sustainability look like in the context of future mining development? As is true for any of the world's mining jurisdictions, it is, it is imperative that new projects are carried out with quality and experienced investments in a way that minimizes environmental risks and maximizes benefit to society. There are examples worldwide of past operations that were not done with appropriate standards. It is essential to learn from environmental shortfalls that occurred in mining operations such as the Marmalake Zinc Mine in a, far a Farcarlacasa Fjord and the Church Rock Uranium Mill in New Mexico. It is essential that governments have the capacity to effectively oversee, regulate, inspect, and enforce mining operations, and this is an area that has been a focus of our cooperation with Greenland. The ability to share experiences and perspectives is invaluable, as is the opportunity to learn from each other, as every mining jurisdiction has its own unique considerations and ways of applying leading international practices. Ensuring that the benefits of mining flow to the national economy and society at large also is important. The Ministry of Mineral Resources has a well-considered social impact assessment process that contributes to an impact benefit agreement with mining companies. It is important that these accurately reflect actual mining company investment profiles and activities so that direct and indirect benefits of mining, when done properly, um, can be effectively measured as a positive contribution to economic growth and society. Renewable energy also can play a positive role in mining, and we are providing advisory support to the Ministry of Energy to inform the policy and investment frameworks that will incentivize the use of renewables by commercial and industrial users such as mining companies. I have no doubt that Greenland is ready to meet the challenges ahead, including those associated with large-scale and potentially impactful investments, such as the Citronin Fjord zinc mine, um, the Tambres rare earth mine, and the Dundas ilmenite mine, as well as many others that are on the horizon, and that these can be developed successfully in a sustainable manner that benefits both Greenland and investors. Ensuring the long-term mining sector sustainability is not just important for Greenland's future, but also for the Arctic and the world. The United States looks forward to continuing to partner with Greenland and other mining jurisdictions to help promote um, 
and ensure the goals of sustainability and sound mining sector development. And doing so will be essential to ensuring success of the green transition during the coming decades. Uh, Kayanak, thank you. Thank, thank you, Paul, very much. Uh, it strikes me, I want to follow up with a question here. It strikes me that not only was that a mind-numbing buffet portfolio of, of minerals and resources that you, you rattled off at the very beginning, uh, which is uh, even more substantial than I thought, uh, but so that's one striking matter so that you can see why there's such an interest in, in Greenland uh, and why the Prime Minister has this as a one pillar of, of investment economic diversity, but also the fact that the Department of State is engaged actively in, in this, this arena. Uh, and, and maybe industry would look to invest in such an incredible r rich resource that our future now depends on, not just the transition to green energy, but our cell phones and our cars and everything else we do, including maybe these microphones. But I have to ask the question, uh, it is such a challenge to bring venture capital north. You have to make that really tough choice if you're a company, ha and governments, how do you bring money north when, uh, especially in this kind of an environment? So can you just give me a, a, a peek into uh, how you can attract maybe U.S. investment in the North? It's one thing for the State Department to be engaged, which is wonderful. But how do you get industry to invest here, and what other challenges might there be to getting industry to invest? Wonderful, thanks. Um, it's actually really challenging in terms of investing in the mining sector in the North. Um, capital costs are maybe two or three times what they are in the South. Um, I think with respect to Greenland, um, as, as in other frontier mining countries around the world, um, one can sort of bucket it into four different challenges. Um, I wouldn't want to overstate it, but really the top challenge, and I would say 90% of the risk on that mining companies perceive is related to geological risk because the money is in the rocks that are in the ground. And the amount of time that it takes to fully explore and assess and characterize what the deposit is and then move it from resources to reserves categories and NI-101s and JORC um, standards, um, it, it takes a lot of money, it takes a lot of time. So reducing geological risk is like the critical thing. And that segues to the second challenge, which is the mining industry is made up of prospecting and exploration companies. It's also made up of mine development companies, and these are two very, very different skill sets. And um, this actually explains why there's a dichotomy between a large number of exploration permits for concession areas and very a few number of sort of exploitation-like licenses. So it's really the burden is on exploration companies, um, many of which are undercapitalized, and I'm speaking worldwide here, um, all of which are trying to prove up a resource which potentially might be world class and to go sell that to a major company, um, hopefully of quality and which has money that then can develop this. So and that's really the second issue. The third is in, in the context of Greenland and, and, and many other jurisdictions, um, it, it's, and there's, there's no proven model. So, how does a large-scale, world-class mining operation in Greenland play out over 20 years or 50 years? So what's the risk here? Um, so political risk in Greenland obviously is extremely low, but the issue is it's a financial impact in terms of, you know, how is the ore being de um, um, like developed? Do you know what the grade is as you're developing it over time? And um, you know, the fiscal regime, is there a potential for changes, and how do the royalty and tax rates some um, structure out um, for like the long term in terms of what is the NPV and the IOR for actually getting money of the mine in the long term. So the longer that timeline goes on before the capital is recovered, um, that's the challenge and that's the greater risk. Um, and then finally, I think um, with respect to Greenland, uh, particularly it's, it, it's remoteness. And this isn't really about remoteness to market um, because one can ship ore anywhere and, and, and everything is possible. Um, it's actually remoteness to, to infrastructure um, like power plants and deep water ports. Uh, for mining operations, it's water. Um, so one can have a world-class mine but not have the water in order to actually um, sustainably develop it. Um, and then issues like labor. Um, and this is a problem in the Canadian Arctic as well where one there, and, there's, and there's just no inhabitants nearby, and one will need like 300 workers or 600 workers. So where does all that come from? So those are the four big challenges I think I'd highlight. Thank you very much. And you answered the question. I mean, a country of 57,000 people, 
one and then two, hearing the Prime Minister's thoughts about economic development, infrastructure, the use of hydro, all, all of those things. Infrastructure is there, but how much more is needed for that? So thank you for the clarity on that. David, let me, let me allow you to uh, follow up and be the next speaker. Thank you. Okay. Great. Good afternoon. It's great to reconnect with my friend too from Greenland. The last time we all met was in Nook at the Joint Committee meetings last September. So it's great to see you here. I want to thank the Greenland government, uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, the Prime Minister, and Kenneth, of course, for your roles and involvement in really strengthening U.S. ties. And also the Wilson Center, Mike and Ambassador Green, for your work to really improving and strengthening the U.S. Uh, Greenland ties and your, your advocacy for uh, U.S.'s involvement there. So I was the first USAID representative to Greenland. In 2020, I opened up the USAID office in Nook, uh, which co coordinated with our council there. And USAID's efforts reflect in Greenland a model of a partnership grounded in shared democratic values and the agency's expertise in promoting enterprise-driven, broad-based economic growth. We will continue to partner with the people of Greenland to support the economic growth goals of a longtime ally and partner. The U.S. and Greenland have a shared history to promote climate-friendly, sustainable economic development. The USAID is identifying opportunities for private sector investments to help grow and diversify Greenland's economy, to increase trade and investment, grow in the green economy, tourism expansion, increase exports, and sustainable community development. Key to Greenland's future is building a strong foundation of economic resilience and self-reliance. USAID will enable Greenlandic-led and, where possible, enterprise-driven solutions to expand economic opportunities and diversification and workforce readiness through self-identified local capacity building, private sector growth, trade and investment, and the promotion of green growth through the use of cl U.S. clean tech inter integration. And USAID is committed to deepening its engagement with Greenland to support of Greenland's efforts to enhance its economic competitiveness, their workforce development, increase trade and economic diversification, increase opportuni opportunities through tourism, and development of sustainable rural communities, advance the use of clean technologies and climate change adapta adaptation, and support of good governance initiatives in the energy and mineral sectors. We have laid the foundation for this work in the assessment of the opportunities and constraints to the diversification of the economy, the development of tourism and fishery in industries, export promotion, and broad-based community development. That assessment developed a baseline upon which we can measure the results of future cooperation and provided data to help the U.S. and Greenland target areas in which our involvement can make a positive impact. Following that, we had an assessment noting Greenland's vast geography, that assessment noted Greenland's vast geography, small population, the need for broad-based workforce development, economic dependency on fisheries, the high cost of infrastructure, development, and the prevalence of state-owned enterprises in the commercial markets, and also the lack to U.S. markets. Following that was a stakeholder-led assessment in South Greenland, focused on the need to reduce transportation costs, use of cleaner energy, and modernize waste management services in order to realize the enormous potential and economic opportunities in Greenland. USAID plans to launch several new activities in 2022 in cooperation with the Government of Greenland, and some of these new design programs supports workforce readiness, entrepreneurialism, small and medium-sized business capacity for growth, bilateral commercial coordination, and clean technology adoption. And we signed one of the first agreements with Greenland last year, our Development Cooperation Assistance Agreement with the Government of Greenland uh, and myself. And one of the things we looked for is a proof of concept, not necessarily more agreements, but a proof of concept. Like we also talked about, is following the fish, following the beer. How do we follow the fisheries from the U.S., from Greenland to the U.S.? How do we meet those economic ties with us? It's not necessarily a legal or regulatory issue, but it's getting the markets open and getting businesses in Greenland familiar with U.S. businesses and U.S. businesses familiar with Greenland. The Department of Commerce has been very key to that as well. Maine has been very key to that. Uh, you know, Greenland's office in Boston, the U.S. reputation here, and also the Minister of Foreign Affairs back in Nook has been really essential to making this work. Uh, so we want to continue working with that and kind of make sure we make those connections between producers and suppliers and open the markets up to really get, be familiarized. I think they were f if you look back in the history of Nook in World War II, the Sears Robot Kind of Law really made a big impact in Greenland. And that showed U.S. markets to Greenland and vice versa. We need the new Sears Roebuck catalog. How do we make this work to make that connection? And I think, you know, getting kayak beer from Narsak, getting Greenland fish here in the U.S. is really key to that. And make sure those connections, those personal to person bases uh, are established. And that's really going to move us forward in the next, next steps. So to me, it's an exciting time to partner with Greenland. I'm looking forward to the future opportunities. Uh, and I'm really glad to continue the conversations. Thank you. Well, Thank you very much. I have a, a follow-up, but uh, we, we may have to put a qualifier on the re website to uh, explain to a certain 
demographic what Sears Roebuck is. So <laughs> thank, thank you for, for doing that. Uh, but you're right. I mean, it is a phenomenal look back in history in terms of the impact of Sears Roebuck and access to U.S. markets. But I wanted to follow up on just one of the many issues you, you noted, which is this idea of workforce. How do we, collective, the collective we, how, do, how does Greenland grow that workforce, 57,000 or so people, uh, and what, what can we bring to bear to help them? I mean, this is, a, this is a daunting, I mean, what Paul just noted in terms of what's meaning in the mining sector, that alone would be daunting. But now we're talking about tourism and infrastructure and airports and all the pieces that go with it. So can you give us a little idea of what, what might be some of the strategies that would go into developing that workforce from a U.S. perspective? Well, from us, really, the thing for us is to listen to Greenlanders. And to, to, you know, we have a lot of ideas, but we really need to be a local-led solution. We need to make sure we talk to Greenlanders. So our listening tour was really make sure we go out to the different communities, talk to East Greenlanders, South Greenlanders, West Greenlanders, you know, talk to them, say, okay, what do we need to do? What's the gaps? Identify those gaps, those constraints and opportunities, and whether it be as virtual-led uh, instructions, bringing people on board. And then we found Greenlandic-led people who want to look at an entrepreneurship. So one of the deals, we're d one of the uh, new programs we're looking at is the Future Foundation of entrepreneurs, which is a Danish organization, but also based in Greenland, to really look at working in the schools, uh, in the gymnasiums, and in the uh, communities to work at how do you get entrepreneurism? How do you get people thinking about other challenges? And looking for Greenlandic leadership. How do you get people like Rebecca or you know, Kenneth as a, as a model for other people in Greenland to really look to, to the success? You see the Prime Minister as a model of what you can do in Greenland as Greenlandic youth to really take charge of the future. So that's what we're looking for. And it's got to be Greenlandic led. We can enable, we can help, but we got to listen to Greenlanders and really look at what makes sense. And exchanges, uh, whether it's yeah, scientific right. exchange or exactly. exchange, the academic exchanges. The State Department and also we're looking at different exchange programs, we're looking at bringing people on, on board there, and, you know, and look at going to market. You know, how are we going to make sure whether they have more people in Greenland, how we look at the people in Greenland take ownership of their, their future, and the economic self-reliance, how they see where they want to go and where they look at workforce development and see themselves as part of the future. Thank you for that. Bo both, I have so many questions for you and you and you and Paul, but we're going to put those on hold for a moment. <clears throat> uh, Dane, I want to come to you because we're we're kind of doing a funnel here. It's mm -hmm. now, so we're just going to follow the flow of the funnel, which is we have State Department and USAID, two two, two federal agencies, looking to uh, that relationship and grow that partnership and relationship. And we kid around a bit, but it's really true. Maine really is central to a lot of what the, the economic activities, the culture activities, the the ties that bind us from the United States to Greenland. So I want to give you the opportunity for some opening comments and then follow up with you as well. So thank you. Thank you, Mike, and thank you for the opportunity to be here. It's, uh, it's an honor to be here with this, this audience and, and with these esteemed folks on stage with me. So yeah, I mean, it's, it is true. Um, you know, I, I thought it would be interesting to talk today about how um, you know Maine is playing a role in partnering and supporting Greenland's development right now. Um, you know, if we go back over a hundred years, Maine's been engaging with with Greenland through Bowdoin College um, in the same communities in Greenland for well over a hundred years. Um, our University of Maine Climate Change Institute has been drilling ice core samples and pulling them and analyzing them for probably close to 50 years now. Um, but in the p just over eight years ago, uh, I started my program in the state of Maine, which is the Maine North Atlantic Development Office, which was um, an initiative that the, the state asked to, to start to really focus on developing Maine's connections with the North Atlantic and Arctic regions. So, uh, you know, looking to increase trade, investment, and collaborative activity throughout the region. Greenland has been a focus since the very beginning of this program. And, um, you know, I've taken several trade delegations over to Greenland. Um, we've had regular engagement at the Arctic Circle Assembly in Reykjavik. Um, plan to be in, in Nuuk with a delegation in August for the Arctic Circle Forum. Uh, but really, the big deal in this whole story is to tell you that Maine has weekly service, weekly shipping service, out of the port of Portland connecting to Nuuk, Greenland. So Maine is essentially connecting the U.S. to Greenland on a weekly basis with the shipping. And I'm, I'm looking at Hillary out in the audience, who was just on an Ameskip vessel with me a couple of weeks ago, talking about this. But I mean, that, that is really significant. And so that's you know, one reason why I'm so 
um, excited to be on the stage today talking about that, trying to get the word out more um, that this is an enormous opportunity. It's an opportunity for Greenland to ship more fish to the United States, um, which is amplified by uh, Maine building a cold storage facility on the Portland waterfront that will be opening in the next year. Uh, we'll be able to take in much greater volumes of fish and distribute them throughout the U.S. Um, it's an opportunity for Maine. I mean, I, I hear uh, talk of, of mining, and while you know we've never come at this relationship from a resource extraction standpoint, it's always been about economic partnerships and doing business and and formulating um, academic and, and cultural exchanges. Um, I think Mike alluded to it earlier, that in order to develop a mining site in Greenland, you essentially need to build a city. You need to have roads connecting to that location. You need to build the facility. You need to build housing. You need to build a dedicated port and potentially a dedicated airport. Maine would love to be a preferred supply chain partner for building materials and consumer goods that would serve uh, the community as, as it grows. Um, and we're, we're ready to do it. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, along with that kind of engagement, I think, um, you know, trade will result in some job creation. Um, and Maine would be a partner in workforce development and all of that as well. Just to tell you about some existing partnerships that are, are underway now that may speak to the, the issues that we're ad addressing here, um, I would say that you know, University of Maine School of Law has an exchange program with the University of Greenland, and we'll be taking Greenlandic students into Maine for, the, for that exchange program. Um, University of Southern Maine's tourism program is part of the Arctic Education Alliance along with Alaska and some other U.S. partners. Um, I've just learned that they'll be hosting an education summit for tourism and hospitality in Maine, um, and it's going to be a U.S. Greenland education summit. Uh, we're looking in August at that, um, and it will bring together tourism and hospitality professionals as well as maritime and fisheries management folks. Um, and then it'll move on to Alaska, and they'll, they'll do it there as well. Um, right now, there are 23 Mainers in Greenland uh, with the Arctic Futures Institute, which is a collaboration of uh, Uni University of Maine's Climate Change Institute and University of Maine School of Law. Um, they were there a couple of years ago as well, um, looking at a UNESCO site, looking at common issues. So it's, uh, it's an opportunity to... To, to study an area, um, but to learn from the locals as well, because uh, you know, Maine is, is going through a very similar experience as Greenland. The Gulf of Maine is warming 99% faster than the rest of the world's oceans and has been over a 10-year period. So uh, we have a lot to learn from Greenland, and this engagement is, is very important. Um, so you know, I'll, I'll just finish this by saying, you know. <laughs> My, in my own experience running the Maine North Atlantic Development Office, just in the past week I've done my own small part in helping with the green transition and I'm actually working with the USAID office in Nuke, uh, looking to send uh, hybrid vehicles over to Greenland um, and potentially starting the first uh, Ford dealership in Greenland uh, with hybrid trucks. So. Uh, so thanks for this, this opportunity, I just, uh, you know, it, we're not starting from ground zero here. There's already engagement. There's already logistics infrastructure uh, to build on this engagement. And um, yeah, I look forward to hearing what everyone else has to say. Well, well thank you. I mean, that's news. <coughs> Opening up a dealership and <laughs> we'll, we'll see. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> on, on at least on the way on the agenda uh, and and a possibility. But but that is that is significant when we're talking about. Bu the building blocks of, mm -hmm. of not just an economy, but but the government's vision is laid out earlier today. Uh, let me ask you, Dana, the, the the vision for yes, it's North Atlantic, but you have a special place here for Greenland. The vision for that came from where, and the resources to build the infrastructure, the support for your effort comes from where, and then why? Why does this make sense for Maine? Obviously, geographically, you can figure it out, but how does this fit into all your other efforts? 
Sure. So, I mean, the, the funding for, for my activity is from the state of Maine. I, I, I'm part of the Department of Economic and Community Development and working out of the Maine International Trade Center. Um, you know, it's, it's important to the state to engage in this space uh, because of AIMSKIP's presence, um, because of our proximity to the North Atlantic region, um, and because, you know, it, it, climate change is happening to all of us. And so being a part of discussions regarding the future of the Arctic and how we can bring our best minds forward to help mitigate what's happening, um, prevent it from getting worse, uh, we want to do that. So that is in part why um, and, and how it's funded. Um, how, did it, how did Greenland get on my radar is an interesting, uh, an interesting short story, I'll tell you. I think my first week on the job, I went to Iceland. It was Aimskip's 100th anniversary at that year. And I met with President Oliver Ragnar Grimson, who was president at the time. And he is a very thoughtful person. If you've ever met him, you know that he puts great thought and, and care into his conversations. And when he spoke with me and, and gave me advice about this position, he really spoke almost exclusively of Greenland, saying that it's, um, you know, it will be, become more and more important geopolitically. Um, it'll be an important trade partner, um, but you have to kind of be in it for the long run. There's some work to be done. Uh, and so I've, I followed his advice. It was certainly part of the region that was outlined for me, um, but that was really the first step that got me to, to focus and, and start bringing business delegations to Greenland. Thank you. I, I have, like, like Paul and David, I have other questions, but I want to move, move <laughs> on a little bit here. Thomas, uh, I'm going from uh, now <clears throat> the federal government to a state obviously active uh, with, with the government and with Greenland. Uh, let me allow you for some opening comments, and then I'll follow up with you as well. Okay. Thank, thank you for the info. In, uh, thank you for the invitation and for letting the Minister of Mineral Resources and Justice contribute to uh, this debate. The green transition mu multiplies the demand for many minerals. Therefore, in the years to come, and maybe and now maybe more than ever before, Greenland has an opportunity to uh, develop its mineral resource sector. By developing the mineral resource sector, Greenland can diversify its economy and skills through the new types of job offers in the industry and to the uh, possibility for uh, contracts to uh, existing and new uh, uh, businesses. The mining sector can contribute to the treasury and make Greenland move uh, closer towards uh, more economically to becoming more economically independent. Um, and one of the questions for this debate was, uh, what role can the U.S. play in facilitating environmentally and socially responsible development in Greenland? Well, the most direct role the U.S. can, in the most direct role the U.S. can facilitate environmental and social responsible development by having U.S. companies come to Greenland and explore and uh, develop mines in an, in, an, in an environmental and socially responsible way, and have U.S. financial institutions uh, fund pr um, mining projects in, in Greenland, and uh, in doing so, demanding that it's done in a sustainable way as most financial institutions do. And then more generally, uh, if U.S. companies are demanding that the minerals they use in the end products have been exploited in an environmentally and socially responsible way, uh, that would uh, benefit not only Greenland, but I think uh, the mining sector of the Western world in, um, in general. So that's the private sector engagement. Um, the U.S. government has, has engaged itself uh, with uh, Paul Huber since uh, 2015. Um, uh, Paul Huber came to Greenland, he, and he has uh, traveled a lot and come to know a lot about uh, Greenland. And he has contributed with workshops and most recently with consultancy service that stress test and help Greenland um, develop its uh, mineral resource administration. And that may help paving the way for U.S. companies to uh, invest in Greenland uh, in the future. I also need to, to state that Greenland has terms in place to secure environmental and social responsible mining. Uh, it, it is secured by the government of Greenland, Greenland um, demanding environmental impact assessment and social impact assessment. And, um, and the government is also setting terms for mine site uh, reclamation and so forth. Uh, and the licensee, the municipality, and the government enters into an impact benefit agreement when an exploitation license is granted. 
that said Greenland needs more investment in its mining sector. The system has not been tested with major projects, uh, nor has it been tested with uh, uh, renewable energy as a power supply. Thank you very much for that. Uh, the, re the reinforcement of uh, environmentally sound, sustainable mining was a thread throughout the, the Prime Minister's comments, certainly here today, the importance of U.S. government support. But again, back to the centrality of investments from U.S. companies that you, you can have all the support in the world or from the United States or from other friends and allies that you can possibly ask for. But really, what I consistently hear is that the need for investment and making the argument that the investment will have a return, not just for the company or the other country, but for the, but for the government of Greenland as well. And I wonder if you would just comment on, on my statement. Yes, it should definitely be multiple um, um, beneficial, um, uh, the investment, both for, for, for the company itself, or, or else they would not come, and, uh, and for, for the government, of course. Um, I sometimes wonder why there are not more U.S. companies investing in Greenland, because uh, it seems that the U.S. is one of the major mining uh, um, con countries in the world, but uh, the countries that tend to invest in Greenland, they are, for instance, from um, Australia and from Canada and, and so forth. So. Well, maybe we can come back and, and yeah. visit, visit <laughs> that, that question. I mean, some of it goes back to the Pauls, Paul and, and what David said before, which is the this idea that uh, it takes so long. It's, it's capital intensive, it's workforce intensive, there's a lot of hurdles here. Yeah. But, but that long list of, of opportunity in terms of what the, the world needs as in, the, in that particular, <coughs> excuse me, that particular commodity seems to be the issue that a lot, I would assume a lot of companies are weighing, which is you know, how lead time investment and, and will, I make, will, will I make that back? And then look at the geography and the, impo and the ports and all those things. So, to me, you're building bu the building blocks of not only the government, but the building blocks of making the economic ar argument. And, cr and if I go from fact to fiction, reel me in. But it, but it seems like you're building the building blocks that gets you to that vision where sustainable, clean, uh, cleaner mining that can serve the world. Right? And that that that's not going to happen overnight. But you're putting the building blocks in. Is that an accurate? Yeah, we. Yeah. I think we have much in place actually, and and since since other countries are investing in Greenland, I think uh, we are doing something uh, right. Of course, uh, we have only two minor uh, small mines in operation, and uh, so that needs to develop. What what need what may scare someone off is that, uh, and it was also mentioned today that uh, that's the infrastructure of Greenland. Well, I think you will have to accept if you come to Greenland that we have seaways instead of highways and railways because Greenland is the least densely populated country in the world and we have almost no uh, agriculture. So, and we have uh, deep fjords <laughs> that kind of uh, blocks the, um, prevent us from making roads along the, along the shore. So you, you just have to accept that uh, much of the activity will go by, by sea. But as uh, and Musa uh, as an also mentioned that because uh, it's also a benefit actually that you can that that may be very, very short distance from from the mine to uh, to an ocean going vessel that can take the minerals to 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 the U.S. and and, and to Europe and you see in other countries they may have the mining companies may have to establish several hundred kilometers of railway that's not cheap mm -hmm. but they will get a high score in. Uh, in many surveys, because they have railways, but <laughs> the surveys often often do not look at seaways. Great point. I want to come back to that, uh, Kenneth. I'd like to <coughs> to provide for you th the microphone. I, I know that my friend Alice Rogoff is going to want me to ask you about the particular, very particular issue about hydro, hydrogen, and hydro. So I'm going to come back to that. But Kenneth, please, uh, your opening statement. Yeah, thank you, Mike. Uh, I really lo uh, look forward to the discussion today. And um, yeah, and we have quite some key players in, in our relationships. And um, we have a long history together, the US and Greenland, I mean, stretching more than 80 years back in time. Um, very much to do with military and security, uh, but I believe we also have a large potential for, for trade between us. Um, the eastbound trade that the Prime Minister already mentioned to Denmark uh, has been the trade route for, for, for Greenland for hundreds of years. 
And um, but I mean, the US and North America is actually just around the corner. So to say, um, and we believe that this is the time for us to turn our eyes towards the West and um, to see if it's, a pos uh, if it's possible to import groceries from the US cheaper than from Europe or from Canada. Would building materials be cheaper from North America? Um, now, we do have a little bit of agriculture. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I'm from that area. Could, could the Greenland farmers buy concentrates, fertilizers yeah. from North America? Um, could we increase and expand uh, our seafood exports to the US? There is good indications for it right now. Um, but is the US a new market for our minerals? That's is being uh, discussed very much among you people. Um, could we be the supplier of green energy? Um, and what about tourism, sustainable tourism, the development of sustainable tourism in our country? Do we have interest from the Americans to visit our, our country? I mean, could the Americans turn out in the future to become the largest tourist group in Greenland, um, that's where they are in our neighboring country of Iceland. And, um, but what are the potential bottlenecks uh, into making this into reality? All these ideas and possibilities. Uh, I mean, trade needs interlinking infrastructure. Otherwise, I mean, if we can't get to each other, uh, uh, as persons or our, uh, for our goods, then it doesn't work. So, um, so probably we, we have some challenges there. So talking about infrastructure, our flights and, 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 and shipping is, is eastbound today. Um, and I pretty much suppose this is an issue to address. But anyway, this is pretty much my, my words um, for, for the time being. So thank you. Thank you. And I, I want to comment on this, but we, you know, we have friends here in the auditorium, and we have some time for some questions. So if you have questions, I would like for you to raise your hand in, in a bit, and we'll, we'll take some questions from you here that, that are in the auditorium with us. But Kenneth, I mean, <clears throat> you just went through the, the entire list of opportunities, some already in motion. Mm -hmm. uh, but l let's talk a little bit about that. I mean, if, if we're, we're thinking about tourism, for example, get away from mining for a moment. If we're talking about tourism for a moment, the, the, the brilliance and the, the realization regarding Iceland and, and what has happened there uh, to the good and also some challenges. Um, that was, that was a, lot, a lot had to do with changes in perception in, in airline availability, making, avail making availability, uh, timing of schedules, uh, a commitment to link schedules with other airlines, access to airports, all of those things. And then, you know, obviously things have blossom to the point where if you're in Iceland any time of the year, there, there's a large tourism presence that almost dwarf, that does dwarf at times the population of Iceland. Mm -hmm. So I know that I know that you're not interested in that dynamic, but some of that dynamic wouldn't be bad. So right now to get to Nuke on any kind of predictable basis, mm -hmm. you have to go elsewhere to get there, yes. right? And so how do you, how does Kenneth, because that's what you do in this town and, and, and in Canada and elsewhere, how do you communicate that to, to the United States and what role does the U.S. have in that versus Greenland? And who, who gets to make these decisions about who invests in the infrastructure and the reliability of this so that you can enjoy at least better direct flights, which then I think would open up a lot of the other things we're talking about here. If you have predictable flights and people can come and go and goods and services can come and go in addition to seagoing vessels. Mm. I mean, right now we are building three new airports in Greenland that will that would be a game changer when they're finished. Uh, it will be possible to go to Greenland direct. Uh, it will be possible to go into a plane and somewhere in uh, the northeastern part of the US. Hopefully, we'll get some airliners do this um, and, 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 uh, and, and get to, to Nuke, for instance, mm -hmm. in, in one go. Right now, that's correct, when I'm going home, to my uh, town of Arotok in, in southern Greenland. Then I have to go from, from Dallas to Reykjavik, and uh, sorry, to Keflavik, and then I have to, have to take the bus to Reykjavik airport, and then I have to take 
another uh, smaller plane to Nach uh, Safsberg, a former uh, American base in southern Greenland, and then take a helicopter as well to get to my town. It's, it's a long way. It's, it, it, there's many stops and there's many legs in, in, into that journey. And, and that's, that's probably something that uh, we can work on. And that's what we are doing mm -hmm. by building the airports. And, and, uh, and this will be, I'm, I'm pretty sure, um, I mean, it will be much, I mean, the Greenlandic uh, society, the Greenlandic community, the, the towns will be much more reachable for, for foreigners in the future. So, um, and, and, and there are, I'm pretty sure, business opportunities for, uh, for, for airliners, for, for tourist operators, for peop people who would like to, to build uh, hotels. All this done in a sustainable way, according to uh, the higher standards uh, within that. That's, that's basically our, our main policies. But, um, but uh, I, I think we are moving in the right direction, and we are moving investment from the uh, government of Greenland in the right direction, fulfilling that, that vision. And is that part of the message that the prime minister and team are leaning forward with uh, during their visit? I mean, you do this. We know you do this. You, you, you communicate well in this town uh, and in our country and, and in Canada as well. But is that part of it? I mean, it's kind of like a chicken and an egg thing. If you, you've got to, you have to have to have the infrastructure to make it real to, to industry. But if you don't, and, but you can't as ask industry perhaps to put all the money up front. And, and who does that? So it's, it's a kind of a tough deal, but, but you have a vision, right? And so can you sell that vision? I believe so. And fortunately, I, was, I would almost say it takes time to build an airport. <laughs> and, and, and we are using that time to, to, to make people, uh, you know, uh, the chicken and egg thing, uh, not, not making that uh, hard to, to solve. So, uh, I mean, I really think that we will see, I mean, we have seen the interest uh, towards the, the north, uh, to, towards Iceland, also northern Scandinavia uh, with direct planes. We are going to see the same, uh, I'm pretty sure. Mm -hmm. there, there is an interest. And this all gets me back to the, to the Prime Minister's comments about uh, this is, yes, we want you to invest in Greenland for Greenland, but it's in, it's a number of, it's, it's in the collective interest to invest in, in Greenland. This opens up markets uh, for both sides, but it also, it's the ties that bind. I've said this three times now, but it's, it's partnerships and forging these alliances and relationships that aren't necessarily hard security military relationships. These are economic, these are economic ties, cultural ties, social ties. Uh, that makes us better understand each other, but but refortifies the cooperation and the partnership and the, and the sort of commonality of us all. Uh, I don't. That's just a comment, but it seems that that that's that's a, a thread here. Let me ask if anybody in the audience has a question before I ask another question. We have a little bit of time left. There's got to be one question. Wonderful. If you Jack has a microphone, if you just identify yourself and. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm Renee Crane. I work at the National Science Foundation in the Arctic Sciences section. And as you know, the National Science Foundation funds a lot of research projects in Greenland. We're very interested in the infrastructure to support research, which is, is a topic that um, blends well with tourism, um, but also very much interested in building more bridges with universities and institutes in Greenland. Um, and expanding the network of mentoring and opportunities that we um, have been working on for students in, and teachers in Greenland um, to the extent that there could be an upcoming agreement. NSF is very interested in being a part of that agreement. As you know, we um, fund a research station at the summit of the Greenland Ice Sheet, um, which we hope to you know, attract research there as well, um, not just from US, but from European partners. So, Anyway, I, I think my question for you is to, to what extent do you see um, research and engineering as um, sort of helping to benefit this um, buildup of economic opportunities in Greenland? And um, also just to let you know that NSF is very interested in being a partner and a collaborator in all of your ventures. Thank you, Renee. Kenneth, do you want to take that and then maybe Thomas as well? Yeah. Um I know very well that uh, th there is quite a bit of <laughs> there is quite a bit of um, um, interest from the U.S. side also to uh, involve us as a as a community, and it's 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 very much uh, 
that's it's very much a, a, a wish from, from from our side as well that this is done, so that the I mean it's not only just a, a group of scientists moving in, uh, do their work, and then they move out. We would like uh, very much to interact. Uh, you know. You know that you can share uh, the knowledge, the the, the results uh, with us, and I'm pretty sure we can help you in, in that process as well. And uh, also that that our entrepreneurs, our contractors, uh, can be the one contributing to 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 the things that has to be done in in, in terms of, uh, of of science and research, and also in terms of our infrastructure, our our. Uh, our own airline companies uh, will be able to support you, and they do. And uh, I mean, so yes, that's a. I would say it's it's both a, a very good uh, opportunity as a as a way for us to to get more knowledge, and and we can also provide knowledge, but it's also a business opportunity for us. Uh, so thank you very much for your words. <laughs> thank you, Thomas. Any, anything along those lines? <coughs> well, I, I think we are open for cooperation in general so just send an email if you want to discuss something <laughs> i think we just struck a deal right here yeah. okay <laughs> thomas I'd, I'd like to fo please renee a number of years ago there was a direct flight from baltimore to Kangerlussuaq and uh, opened up tourism i think it may have only been for one summer but <laughs> i don't know if there were some lessons learned there i mean i could see some of the complications that made it harder for american tourists to kind of pick up on that thread, but I think it was like a really great opportunity and, and uh, with a few tweaks, uh, more of the types of tourists that you're looking for, which I, I really took seriously the words of the prime minister about not just opening. I, you know, I can see you do not want cruise ships full of hundreds of people who don't really care about the Arctic or its people or its environment necessarily. Um, not to, you know, denigrate that, that's an industry that works very well in some places, but that does not seem to be what Greenland is looking for, but rather to attract the people who want to go backpacking and fishing and, and um, hiking and things like that as a, um, and so I, I wondered if there's more that you learned from that, that time, I can't remember what year it was, when there were the direct flights from Baltimore. My impression was that, um, is that uh, this time we are, uh, Pretty, well, we're really working on it, preparing for for, for this opportunity. Uh, I'm I'm not sure, you know, the how long it was prepared back then. Uh, was it back in 2005 or seven or something like that? Long time ago. Um, but it's my impression that now, also with this, uh, the possibility of a one leg tour travel, that's probably going to change the whole thing. Uh, I'm pretty sure. And and then you have this pretty long-term uh, preparation uh, right now. I mean, the airport is not going to be finished tomorrow. <laughs> so it's another, I believe it's three years uh, more, yes. Mm. Thomas, a, a question about, <coughs> excuse me, about hydrogen and how that might fit into the portfolio of <coughs> development in the, in the uh, green energy equation. Can you speak to that at all? Maybe Paul as well, I don't know. I think it's only natural if uh, Greenland uh, uses hydropower to produce e-fuels. Uh, that the e-fuse is also uh, consumed in uh, in Greenland, both by the by the mines and uh, and other industries in Greenland, because there's no national grid in uh, in in Greenland. Uh, each uh, town settlement and uh, mine will have to establish its own power facility. So, and uh, it it could be very costly, of course, if a mine sh uh, as opposed to uh, a one story make a hydropower facility, it may double its uh, capital investment. So if they can set up a system uh, as they do today with uh, diesel and just use e-fuels instead, that would be uh, very beneficial, I think. Paul, any comments on that? Yeah. I, I think e-fuels is the way of the future, and we, we've, we've done a little bit of cooperation on hydrogen, but I think there's, there's a lot more to do. Um, on, on, on hydroelectric power, we've actually had a pretty extensive cooperation with both the Ministry of Energy as well as New Kisher Fit. Um, we've done um, um, design and engineering studies uh, for from, from micro hydro, mini hydro, um, in places like Kulasuk and Narsamit in, in like South Greenland. Uh, we're doing the um, on the Kangaroo-Salak Airport um, um, hydro study uh, coming up like this summer. Um, on a separate track, we actually have, and this has come up a few times in terms of large-scale hydro potential in West Greenland, um, we actually do have advisory support, that, and that's working on um, 
providing sort of a range of kind of technical analysis to, to just do like a rough vetting of um, some of the data and conclusions that were done dating back to the 1970s because a lot of this was done originally back then when those five or six um, like sites were originally was, um, like were selected. Um, and then kind of helping the ministry in terms of understanding like the business case because um, this is marketed towards like um, large scale industrial um, and potential commercial users like, um, like IT um, 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 companies. Um, and, you know, a good example would be Alcoa, which until 20, 2015 um, had had a proposed um, aluminum smelter um, in Manitsoc um, that was going to be hyd um, hydropower, um, um, like, um, like powered. So, and that unfortunately fell apart with the commodity market crash, but there's a lot of potential there. Um, the ministry was just in Rotterdam um, at a big conference, a hydrogen conference, I think it was back about a month ago or a few weeks ago. Um, and so I think it's, um, it, it's a major interest of the ministry. And I think there's just a huge amount of potential there um, just in terms of available megawatts, um, hundreds and hundreds of megawatts. But um, um, I think there's a real case to be made there for investment. Okay. Yes. Good. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, let me just check one more time for questions because I have a few more of the panel and then we'll, we'll wrap up. We're coming up to the end of our time. Okay. Uh, David, USAID and their efforts uh, in Greenland. Uh, one of the questions that came to me from a, a friend in the Texas, why is, he, why is USAID involved in Greenland? I mean, yes, the consulate, yes, the workforce development, but why? What's what's central to Greenland that fits the central mission of USAID, which is the way it came over on the text? Can can you crosswalk those our USAID's interests and Greenland's interests? Yeah, it may not come natural to why USAID is there. And obviously, it, our former minister Mark Green obviously has some reservations at first to to go into Greenland. But I think we've we've demonstrated that the need for partnership, the need as we are good neighbors. And the soft power of USAID is really important to kind of build that relationship with, with the Greenland government and really work at, you know, the other areas. There's diplomacy, there's development, there's defense. And I think diplomacy has done a great job and defense has done a long time standing there. But, you know, the development, though, really building the relationships up, look at the economic ties, the private sector mobilization is going to be critical to the overall future. And I think that, you know, whether it be maintaining the Thule Air Force Base, whether it be working at the economic ties, USAID can do so much to really help that development of the relationship to look at, you know, some of the barriers. When we were looked at Air Greenland, some of the, the challenges they had uh, establishing these routes. Look at IMSKIP. One of the questions right now, even though there is this route from Portland to uh, Nook, it, the goods don't go from Nook to IMSKIP to or Nook to Portland. They still go back to Denmark first, retransport it back to IMSKIP, and then, you know, to uh, Iceland and back to, to uh to uh, U.S. So there's ways we can get through some of those barriers and some of those concerns we have and help them think through the uh, opportunities. So I think it's critical for USAID to be in Greenland, and maybe not forever, but uh, definitely for a time period to help build their self-reliance up and look at how they can take care of more of their own economic development. They look at, you know, the sanctions and the impact on Russian, you know, that market's going away. How can we help kind of be a U.S. partner to that and develop U.S. ties to take some of the market to the U.S., but also develop the U.S. investment. And we've done a lot, my bureau, which is on uh, Central Europe and East European, we've done a lot of economic growth opportunities and investment in energy and economic growth. And I think those areas will be critical to Greenland's future, and I see a long-time partnership between the two countries. I'm glad we were able to, to participate in that and build that relationship. Yeah. Thank you. Kenneth, a follow-up on the Dana, I want to come back to you for, for mm -hmm. a final. Yeah, I think it's important to remember that the EU Development Agency has been working in Greenland for decades. So it, that's, it's not that different from what we're used to. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Dana, how could, how, what role would the U.S., should the U.S. government take? What roles to support what you're trying to do in Maine vis-a-vis -vis Greenland? That's one of the messages from the from the Prime Minister today is that th there's this bilateral, we want the United States closer to us. It's a, you know, the, the principal could be the principal partner, the partner of choice. But it really happens, it doesn't happen mostly government to government. It happens through this panel and who you all represent, and it happens through states like yours. So what, what could the United States do that would help you achieve your mission as it's related to Greenland? Well, it is good that we have a U.S. consulate in Nuke now um, and that USAID is there. Um, both of them have been 
great partners in making connections in Greenland. Um, you know, we, we're planning to bring a small delegation to Nuke in August for the Arctic Circle event. Um, I'll be needing to put together business schedules for them. So having folks on the ground, in addition to our terrific partners in the government of Greenland who can help facilitate those introductions, um, arrange the meeting schedules, and qualify leads for us um, would be really helpful. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of discussion around the importance of investment in Greenland today that keeps coming up. And, you know, I think one area where we could use some help is just understanding the process for that. How, how can Maine or U.S. companies engage in the business environment, the investment environment for, for developing projects in Greenland? Um, how do we establish a local presence there? That's you know, as, as someone who's been working in Greenland for about eight years, I'm, I'm not entirely clear. Um, but certainly some of the, the businesses I've worked with have expressed uh, initial interest in, in perhaps opening an office in Greenland um, so that they can participate more at a, at a partnership level with folks and eventually invest in projects and, and maybe even participate in um, bids on government procurement projects, that sort of thing. So. I think that's one area where the U.S. government could really help us. I, I just wrote down the title of the of the initiative, which is something like Greenland U.S. Economic Process Roadmap or something. That gives Perfect. You, yeah, I don't know, but but it's something that gives you sort of the at least if nothing else a visual of you know if this then go here if not that then come back. I mean, it's got to be something like that. Is that what you're talking about? Yes. Where, where to go? What organizations? What banks, what what mechanisms, those kind exactly. of things. Exactly. Right? Okay. Thank well, I, I won't be doing that anytime soon, but it seems like we need we need one of those, so we'd be happy to help. Um, we're, we're out of time, but I want to thank all of you <coughs> for participating in this version of the Greenland Dialogues. We've been doing this for several years now, since 2017. As I said before, we will continue to do them. Uh, we'll look forward to doing them elsewhere with partners uh, like we've done before. Uh, but Kenneth, Thank you very much for all of your work and for your friendships and partnerships, but thank you for being here today. Dana, thank you for coming down uh, from the great state of Maine and for participating in this important discussion. Paul, thank you very much for your insights, your perspectives, but all the work that you have uncovered for us that you've been doing over time. David, same, not just with the consulate, but providing the support with USAID. And Thomas, thank you for giving a sort of a ground truth briefing to us about what's reality on the ground and what's doable and what next steps might be and how wonderful it was that it all fit within the Prime Minister's speech. This was not rehearsed here at all, and <laughs> they can all tell you that, uh, but, it, but it was thematically networked and hooked together. So I want to thank you all. Let's not make this the last time we do this, and I want to thank you all today for coming to uh, the Wilson Center in D.C. and for all of our friends and colleagues watching all over the world. Thank you for taking the time. We will do this again, and please have a good rest of the afternoon, morning, or evening. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>